Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Entrepreneur India's uh, Resilience Series. Uh, the ongoing pandemic has forced everyone, humans, businesses, to change the way one was operating at the start of 2020. It is human nature to adapt and move on. And that is what startups have also done. We are today going to look at how and why businesses pivoted and what that meant for them. I'm Saurav Kumar, Editor of Special Projects, Entrepreneur India, the moderator for this session. I will quickly lay down the rules for our, our, our attendees. Our discussion will go on for 30 minutes and followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. If you have any questions during the course of the discussion, you can post them on our Facebook uh, through, uh, through comments on Facebook and we'll pick it up at the end of the session. Uh, do mention if it's, uh, uh, it's, if it's directed to any specific panelist. Let me now introduce our panelists for the day. We have with us today, Mr. Amit Agarwal, co-founder and CEO of NoBroker.com. Mr. Amit Ramani, founder and CEO of Office. Mr. Avinash PR, co-founder Clover Ventures. Welcome everyone. So to start with, uh, let me ask, come to each of you and ask that, you know, to tell the audience very briefly, what changes did you make to survive a period of, say, zero revenue, maybe, and what outcomes did you uh, did you achieve? So, uh, Mr. Agarwal, if I can come to you first, please. Uh, so, uh, in our business, which is a real estate business, uh, <laughs> not having customers, not being able to go on the ground and see properties, is a big, big setback, right? Because the entire real estate is about going, seeing properties, renting them out or buying them. And for us, uh, that was a big shock. In fact, when it happened in March, we, like everybody else, we thought it is a one month affair or two month affair, but it kept on going on and on. And of course, in the month of um, April and May, our revenues took a dip of 50%, our customers uh, went down by 50%. Uh, we took solace from the fact that at least it is not 90% down, it's 50% down. And I think just like every other entrepreneur in this panel, we also thought as to how we can innovate. And the team basically found ways in which uh, we can organize meetings over uh, with customers over video call. Uh, many of the owners started giving us the videos of the properties because when you're taking it off for renter, uh, it's a, not a very large decision and hence... If it's an apartment society and the video is good, you can make uh, make a decision and people started making a decision. So I think that was some innovation that we did. Uh, this uh, summer, summer is typically a peak season for us. Uh, so it got shifted. Uh, that was a setback. But thankfully, the way in which it went down, it also uh, improved drastically. In July, our biggest city, Bangalore, was in lockdown. Uh, and in August, uh, everything jumped back beautifully. We did our highest revenue, higher customer base in the month of August. And the thing which was harming us in the month of April, uh, because we kept on giving it a fight, started benefiting us because customers said that instead of visiting a physical broker, going to his office or spending more on brokerage, let's try to save some money and then do some internet search. Uh, so, so in a way, basically situation has changed. Uh, so we had a V-shaped recovery and hoping for better days. Okay, good that you've seen a V-shaped recovery. A lot of people really want to see that and uh, for the entire economy. Mr. Raman, if I can come to you with the same question. So, Saurav, firstly, thank you uh, for inviting me and thank you to the entrepreneur team as well. Glad to be here. Um, I think uh, clearly uh, some of the things, I think so the way we approached it was we our core business essentially is a mix of um, you know our co-working and our enterprise clients, and uh, obviously it ranges between B two B clients, which are more stable and long term, to B two C clients, which are more startups and uh, freelancers and smaller SMEs. Uh, so clearly, we saw some um, you know uh, really in terms of the smaller cohorts, which were our SME base and our startups, we saw uh, exits happening. Right. So as of April, we started seeing a trend, and then obviously it started getting. Um, larger and larger as we went ahead. What, what really worked for us, I think, is two, three things in the core business. One, uh, we had enterprise clients which were long-term customers with us and they're continued to use our spaces to host our, their server spaces, use our you know, platform, use it for meeting rooms, whatever reasons the enterprise customers continued and that was 75% of our base. 
so that gave us some level of you know uh, support as we went uh, ahead second our landlords and our partners right and we were in a model where uh, almost 60% of our space was in partnership with the landlord so there was no fixed rent and as a result of that strategy which we had instituted in 2016 it helped us because when our partners made money in the good times they also were able to support us in some of the challenging times so i think that uh, in terms of foresight really helped and third we raised capital in september of 2019 which was primarily luck i was as i would call it and we were well capitalized for the business and uh, we were profitable since november of 2018 all of these things which were irrelevant pre covid and which right. have become very relevant uh, kind of helped us manage the business really well and i think we are now seeing uh, the business become stable so instead of more exits i mean we are adding more seats in fact the last 5 months our sales have been 80 85% above pre covid levels so clearly we see a recovery it's not uh, i don't think it's we as yet but it's certainly a switch right it's uh, it's recovering but it's recovering well second what we did was we went in and looked at what was going to change in terms of customer behavior right customers were earlier all required to come to a central location and we saw that completely changing so we what we did was we looked at the behavior of the customer and what was in real estate location 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 now became location choice and time so customers changed and customers uh, uh, employee base changed right so people were not willing to travel to come to a center uh, and they were willing to work from home or work from a nearest center so because we had a distributed network of almost 70 centers across india we were able to offer work near home solutions we also pivoted and launched what we call as office at home which is a basically subscription based desk and chair at home gives you all the amenities at home so that was the first pivot we did the second was we understood really well that in terms of people managing their own spaces right earlier most of the facility management in spaces was being done by unorganized players right 90% of the market was that way so we launched office care which basically helped us manage spaces for other customers and which allowed people to have a sense of safety and security coming into a branded environment being managed by a branded player uh, the third was office transform people were exiting their spaces reducing their footprint so we worked with enterprise customers to reduce their footprint and the excess real estate we were able to take on board and offer it to other customers that were looking at you know just in time basis and the final solution was powered by office a lot of players were in the market co working players hotel players mall players which were trying to do something similar so we have gone in and now started managing those single one two three locations thus having the network of you know across india Uh, allowed us to be able to manage those uh, solutions for uh, people who are trying to do these one, two, three locations uh, on their own. So all of this, I mean, the core business got protected. We pivoted and you know managed that really well by managing our landlords and our customers really well. On the other side, we launched these new services. The new services in the last four months is almost fifteen percent of our revenue right now. So I mean, those are the things that we did to kind of you know keep the business going and kind of get into a recovery mode. Yes, okay. Uh, before I go to Mr. Avinash, I'll stay with you, Mr. Ramani, and uh, I'll request uh, uh, everyone, gentlemen, in case you have, uh, you know, you want to chip in anywhere in between the discussion, please feel free to do so. I'll I'll keep on que- uh, shifting questions here and there. Uh, Mr. Ramani, so you talked about that, you know, you've reached eighty eighty five percent of your pre COVID. So, is there a change in terms of the quality of the uh, uh, purchase that you're witnessing, or or in terms of uh, you know type of businesses that are coming in? for by or yeah. maybe the ticket size is there a is there a change that you seen pre covid post covid so, so saurav i think pre covid the life was uh, 90 95% of people went for conventional space right uh, co working space or flex space was only a small portion of their portfolio i think clearly what is visible right now is that people are giving up their conventional offices wherever the lease is coming up for renewal lock stock and barrel the market which was 60 million square feet in 2019 will at best do about 20 million square feet this year right and co working which was about almost 25 million square feet is projected to grow in the next 2 to 3 years to 125 million square feet right so clearly the shift in the customer behavior is moving into flex because uncertainty and moving from a capital intensive conventional space 
to an operating uh, expense oriented flex space is a clear trend we are seeing and it is going to be here forever it's the demonetization moment for uh, uh, fintech companies that's exactly what's happening in real estate for co-working companies right now okay okay all right all right we'll come back to that discussion i'll go to mr avinash now mr avinash going to going back to our first question that uh, you know that uh, uh, what were the changes that you did uh, to you know during the during this entire pandemic period to stay relevant to stay focused to stay in the business and to thrive whenever the situation comes back to normal yeah i think uh, so given that we are in the perishable fresh produce space uh, ours is a business that actually involves physical movement of uh, goods right so from the farm the freshly harvested fruits and vegetables have to come to our warehouse it has to get graded packed and then leave to the customer right so the biggest challenge that we saw was actually the uh, actually maybe a step back ironically the first impact of covid so to speak was a non linear increase in um, uh demand right because people were living with this heightened sense of awareness as to where they are buying their fruits and vegetables from right uh, the larger format stores were some of them were shut so kirana stores which is one of our channels saw a high footfall so ironically the first impact of covid was a non linear increase in uh, demand for us unfulfilled to, uh, demand to be honest uh but then we went through the same challenges as most of the others where there was heavy uncertainty in terms of uh, Uh, whether we'll be able to operate, whether people will be able to reach their workplaces, especially warehouses, uh, whether the vehicles would be able to operate in all of the areas, uh, villages that we are uh, going to. So we went through a whole lot of uncertainties. Uh, so three things possibly that we did is one is obviously uh, we had to rejig the roles in the corporate office for different people to start doing different roles, given that you're not able to step out, right? So we had. completely uh, people who are not involved in operation start look, looking into operations to lend a helping hand so a lot of people started donning uh, different hats i would say secondly from an infrastructure point of view because again warehouses is where a lot of people work so we had to sort of de risk and ensure that there's uh, absolutely no risk to any of the stakeholders internal or external in terms of any of the risks so we had two different warehouses so we had to clearly bifurcate operations ensure that the two warehouses there's no people or material movement happening between the two warehouses so sort of really operate them as silos right and um, on the on the demand side and consumer side uh, we've always prided on the fact that the material uh, that the uh, produce that we grow is grow it's grown in a clean environment and handled hygienically so not much of tinkering needed to change on the output or the delivery side but especially on the farm side especially on the warehouse side and especially on the corporate uh, office side right in terms of people process is what we actually had to really rejig and think for the covid environment as opposed to the uh, operational efficiency environment if you will so those are some of the things that we did uh, uh, during covid um and uh, yeah i think i mean post the two months of uncertainty some sort of semblance and balance started to coming in um and i think we've grown by about uh, uh, six times to eight times at the peak of covid i think uh, we were our volumes that we were handling came down by more than 50% but then from the baseline if february was the baseline to now i think we've grown by over six times to eight times uh Hyder, we are present in Bangalore and Hyderabad. Hyderabad was operationally much more constrained than Bangalore because uh, we had just taken up a warehouse space, but we were unable to occupy and start uh, sort of operating out of that. So all of those challenges have sort of uh, uh, gone away as as time has passed. Mm -hmm. so I'm glad to hear that, that you've grown six to eight times from your baseline in February. That's a very a good sign for the economy so i'll uh, before going to the next question i'll again request our uh, facebook uh, uh, audience to keep the questions coming we'll take them up uh, uh, after the discussion the panel discussion is over so uh, uh, mr avnash i'll stay with you another question that you know we were discussing uh, earlier also that you know what was this pivot in the pipeline already and was fast track due to the pandemic or was it necessary just to remain uh, uh, you know Uh, relevant during this period yeah so i think uh, we started off primarily as a b2b company offering our uh, uh, 
uh, uh, perishable produce to uh, the likes of uh, uh, internet kitchens, fine dining outlets, um, modern trade and general trade. But the way we were building the supply chain capability, which is traceable, uh, first principle based, clean, um, uh, minimal use of chemicals, pesticides, right? We knew that we would serve the end consumer market, the B2C market, if you will, uh, sometime down the line. And for us, that was about 12 to 15 months down the line. But when COVID happened, again, serendipitously, our first thought was not uh, that we will pivot immediately. But the first thought was, how do we ensure that we keep the show running given all of the obstacles, right? But then but then naturally, we started getting requests from societies, from friends and families who are living in apartment complexes telling, hey, uh, you know, given that uh, the last mile delivery is not allowed till doorstep, right? Uh, is there a provision for you guys to come and serve our apartments or societies with your produce, right? So again, it sort of began from a very outside in way and uh, over about 30 to 45 days, which I would say was the March, April time period is when we started realizing, hey, the core of the business, the core of the supply chain, the core of the capabilities uh, is already built, so to speak, right? I mean, we have our farms, the produce is already grown in a clean way. It's not that we had to learn something new on that side, right? We were always handling the produce in a clean environment in the warehouse. It was always packed diligently, right? So even there, it didn't require any change. The only change it required was in the last mile, instead of serving B2B, we had to serve B2C, right? So once the initial request started coming in, that's when we went back to the drawing board and said, maybe we have to view this as an opportunity, given the core or the foundation is not being changed. Right, all the core capabilities exist, but but the face of the end customer, if you will, will change from business to an end consumer. Right. So, what does it entail for us? What are the changes that we had to make? Is what we went back to the drawing board to uh, sort of, as I said, rejig the process, um, the front end delivery mechanisms, and few of the other nitty gritties. Uh, therefore, uh, therefore, to your question. For us, serving end, end consumers uh, was always in the plan. Uh, what COVID helped us was sort of accelerate the plan. And uh, I would say sort of also in some way uh, uh, help us answer the traditional product market fit, if you will, right, uh, in this environment. Um, so I think, I think it was certainly not a, a short-term trigger that we had to maximize, uh, 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 you know, the the situation of COVID to our benefit, but it was always in the plan and we had to accelerate it uh, given the given the constraints uh, that were there. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. All right, Mr. Rumas. Uh, Mr. Agaral, I'll come to you. In your kind of business, I'm sure that, you know, even if I am as a customer, I would want to travel to that location, see how that travel uh, itself, how much time does it take? What kind of road is it? What kind of traffic is it? And then I'll finally obviously see the, property uh, you know uh, uh, you know take a tour and see how the fittings are how the electric the electricals are and everything so for you was it the same as mr avinash mentioned or it's it's something that has been necess necessitated and you have adapted it well uh, so there have been both the cases uh, i would basically split this entire lockdown period or unlockdown period into two phases one is when one is basically the period between march and say May, June, and one is post that. So in the first period where the strict lockdown was, was applied, in that case, uh, the new deals stopped happening for buy and sell. But yes, the deals which were in pipeline, in which the cases the customer had already seen a house, but he was not able to decide whether I should buy it or not. Uh, in, this, in these times, those deals did happen, and we chased those deals to make sure that happens. Owner also to some extent wanted to now get some cash and basically conclude those deals. So he became also a little bit flexible in terms of the price that he was willing to negotiate. In terms of rentals, in the past six years since I have been running this business, I have never seen any deal happening without a person visiting a house. This is the first time that even I am surprised that people in this period did finalize deals uh, by seeing property videos. It's a big revelation to me also. 
uh, that customers also adapt. It's not that we entrepreneurs adapt, but even the customers adapt uh, to the new situation. Uh, so they did adapt. Uh, as soon as the lockdown opened up, the demand, we also do packers and movers, we do painting cleaning, we do furniture, home loan, you know, insurance. I think these were additions during the uh, during the COVID period. Some of these additions were during the COVID period, right? Many of them were basically before. Some of them were during the COVID period. And we were surprised that the moment lockdown opened up, the demand for packers and movers was such that the entire system just buckled. We couldn't handle the demand. Because a lot of people were waiting for these lockdown months. The moment it opened, uh, they just pounced. And we thought that people would still not want to shift houses. But they were. Yes, many of the people did pack and went to their hometowns. But uh, contrary to popular belief, a lot of people did shift houses within cities, across cities. Uh, so we were pleasantly surprised by that. Many of the home interiors, many of the people who had bought the house, but because of lockdown could not shift, wanted to shift, wanted to stop paying rent and wanted to uh, handle the EMIs better. And they requested us for uh, quick home interiors, which we did. Uh, uh, so... So I think post lockdown, post July, we saw a huge surge in demand because a lot of demand was suppressed. So it came back. And now if you talk about today, uh, the buy and sell market is very, very vibrant because almost every newspaper in the country have printed that real estate is in mess. <laughs> so uh, this has basically uh, made every buyer excited. So people who over the years thought, Ki, yes, one day we'll research on what home we want to buy. Now I have more time in their home, internet in front of them, and they are researching, uh, which we can see in terms of traffic. And the seller uh, wants to basically liquidate, the buyer wants to buy. So suddenly there's a splurge, uh, surge in terms of buyer-seller transactions, which personally I could never foresee will happen. Uh, rentals has come to the normal level. Uh, but I would still like to believe that overall rental transactions in the market uh, would have reduced. Uh, that's my intuition. Uh, I'll be really surprised if it has increased. So I would like to deduce that perhaps our market share has increased. Uh, but uh, so that's uh, what I'm seeing with the customer behavior. Mm. So you said that, uh, you know, uh, sellers of uh, properties were ready to negotiate more uh, to, uh, you know, to, to get some cash in hand. And uh, you said that a lot of people actually moved houses. Obviously, there, there was a chunk which went back to their hometowns obviously necessary. So do you, did you see a change where a person who was, say, uh, uh, residing in a 40K, uh, 40,000 uh, uh, flat has actually moved to a 30K house because he wants to save some money? Because obviously there have been job losses, there have been salary cuts and everything. Is that something that you have seen or any kind of trend that you have noticed in terms of the ticket sizes? See, uh, we did notice this trend change when things were much more uncertain. So in the month of May, June, July, uh, the typical transactions did go down. The rent amount went down by 3 to 8 percentage. But the moment I think people have started realizing that this is going to continue for long, long and whatever job losses had to happen have happened and rest of the companies have adapted to the new situation. Uh, now, I, now for rentals, owners are not willing to take a cut. So there was a period when they were willing to take a cut but now that period has majority gone and now it is again happening at the fairer price. Uh, uh, I think if, God forbid, if basically new job losses start to happen, then perhaps trend may change. But right now the rentals have come back uh, to what they were earlier. Okay. Okay. That's, that's sad news for people who want to afford, who want affordable housing. So, uh, Mr. Ravani, I'll come to you, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, to understand from you that you know, all these changes that we're talking about, Mr. Avinash talked about, Mr. Agarwal talked about, you yourself talked about. So are these, uh, obviously, as Mr. Avinash said, that, you know, now that he has turned from B to B to B to C, I'm sure that he would want to continue with it. Or Mr. Agarwal said that, you know, new uh, videos, uh, th 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 taking a tour of the property through videos and then, uh, you know, making it. So do you think these are permanent changes or these are just changes Till the time we find a vaccine or a corona coronavirus decides to leave us alone in peace, uh, you know what do you think? Are these permanent changes, or these are going to be back to again the way we were uh, in terms of behavior? So, uh, sort of at least um, the way we look at it, right? And obviously, there is about seven months of data. 
I think uh, at least when it comes to what I would call as the real estate arena, right? The customer behavior has changed forever, right? So clearly, companies are now going to look at real estate as a uh, flexible option. So the developer community and the landlord community will have to change and adapt because the six-year, nine-year leases, uh, people are so uncertain, right? And uh, obviously, this pandemic is happening right now. We are still not out of it. We don't know. how long this is going to go is it going to go down in terms of number of cases is there going to be again a spike etc so a lot of unknowns are there and unknowns uh, bring uncertainty and uncertainty can be managed by flexibility so i think flexibility is going to be at the core of how companies look at real estate from a consumer standpoint we were forcing people to travel 2 to 2 and a half every hours every day to come to a central location and what has proven in the last 7 months is most companies uh, i can't say for all most companies have been as productive as they were when they were bringing people into that central location so the central location idea will continue but it will continue for a smaller number of people that are required to come for various reasons it could be data security it could be internet speed it could be processes it could also be things like innovation which happens through face to face brainstorming etc right but a large portion our sense is 30% of their workforce is never going to come back to that central uh, location they are going to work near home or work from home as and when we come back and we are seeing that trend in every single company uh, today where they are giving up real estate and nobody is going back to the same amount of square footage they are going back to at least a 25 to 30% reduction in real estate so i think some of this is going to uh, continue the behavior little changes that have come in i don't think the office space is going to go away i don't think homes are structured forever for you know everybody all the household members to be together 24 by 7 i don't think it's it was built societies were never built in that manner so there will be that disconnect where people want to go away for whatever 8 10 hours it could be work near home it could be at a different location it could be at a central location but ultimately office space will come back because we are not structured to live together 24 by 7 at home between husband wife and kids and family so would you say that your solution to provide a office kind of a space at home is a temporary solution and you will not be like this is not a long term solution uh, solution that you will be offering so so sort of i think what is very very interesting and when we launched the work from home product we thought companies will provide the solution to the uh, employees unfortunately companies gave them an allowance so what was basically a b2b product launch that we did became a d2c product market right so direct to consumer so the sale of our desk and chair and the subscriptions has gone up but it's direct to consumer right so clearly what will happen at least our perspective is people will have a space where you can basically have concentrated work at home it could be an extra study room and i'll uh, allude to amit who probably has more data on home sales but clearly there seems to be a trend where a study room or a puja room gets converted at work from home kind of a solution uh, clearly people will have that solution going forward it was not going to be a dining table use a dining table for a one hour kind of a solution people will have that dedicated solution whatever that environment works out for people as they go forward uh i would basically like to add a little bit if uh, if i can yes please go ahead so just basically <laughs> continuing to what mr ramani was saying see what we are observing is you observe it from the from employees perspective also so what i have basically noticed is that there are two types of broad people uh, in every company one who are slightly naughty who basically want to take advantage of work from home want to chill a bit more and second who are passionate who want to basically give all that that they can broadly to category now what is happening is that people who are slightly naughty for them companies are becoming more and more draconian to measure the time that they are spending on work and there are tens of things which you can do with the help of technology much much better so many of these people who earlier felt that working from home is going to be fun are of course enjoying uh, the commute time which is saved and hence perhaps in the future there would be solutions in which they company and they would want to still save the commute time but now they are bored of it they are bored of being constantly monitored constantly questioned 
and they would like to go to a so, so called normal setting in which they have some luxury of some coffee talk of some bitching about boss <laughs> and giving some sanity to a office hours on the second hand the people who are very passionate about work their work life balance is totally screwed they are working from morning to night they are taking calls at all odd hours they have no differentiation between office and life so i would say that yes in many companies perhaps they will continue to work from home but largely people would still want to go to office because it does provide work life balance to people who are passionate and does give a better i would say overall scenario to people who are slightly not here i'm sure there are not your people so uh, uh, mr avinash i'll come to you um, uh, are you working from home or you have you started going to uh, you're going to office we've started working from office, office. Uh, uh, quite some time back actually okay okay so you know my question to you would be uh, you know as we as uh, mr ramani was pointing out that you know uh, the change in behavior uh, you know which is happening so some of it will get retained some of it will you know will again go back to the normal so for you mr avinash like you said that the produce coming to my doorstep at my house obviously it's a, it's a, it's a great benefit but still you know we are in that uh, we have that uh, uh, thinking that we'll go to a market where we'll see two three options that we are available bargain for uh, you know one particular capsicum or anything and then buy the best that we would want uh to you know we would see and take a look and feel of two three and then we'll pick it up so do you think that that's going to change for for your business or do you think the the, the convenience and the quality that you have provided is going to stick with the customers for a long term i think the data is structurally showing that the uh that the e-commerce sales of fnb and groceries has gone up during the period uh okay. right i think it has uh, uh so that's that's a that's certainly a trend uh, which shows that structurally the market is going to move towards e-commerce obviously fnb as a category is still a largely touch and feel category uh, more than 85 or 88% of uh, retail actually happens in the offline environment but yes i think what we have begun to see is uh, especially we are we speak to a lot of senior citizens and uh, they have become much more comfortable today right downloading an app ordering fruits and vegetables which is not their most common behavior right so there are elements in consumer behavior in terms of the choices that that they are making that points towards a structural change um, um, a change but uh, yeah given the space at least in which we are operating uh, it will not be a momentous shift just over a two month three month time frame but over years i think it will head to what we are seeing in terms of the e-commerce penetration in the other markets um if i can spend one minute i think what, where we are actually seeing true structural changes is on the farmer side right uh so farmers were dealing with lot of intermediaries aggregators traders middlemen all of whom actually disappeared dissipated overnight right so this strong thought in a farmer's mind of always wanting to have a structural access to the market for their produce i think that is a huge structural change right i mean we have seen lot of uh, farmers small land holding large land holding green houses no green house all of them actually coming to companies i would say like us clover is not the only one by the way right so companies like us wanting to figure out how to work on a long term structural arrangement for marketing their produce right which is a structural change right and many of these intermediaries middlemen may never come back right so we have seen farmers sort of starting to head towards uh, that obviously overlaying that is the fact that the government has actually brought in a lot of regulatory changes obviously there's there's view points on both sides of uh, uh that regulation change but i think those are those are actually the structural changes which will enable farmers uh to make better remunerative choices for them so on the supply side we have seen changes which are actually going to be structural and long lasting on the demand side or on the consumer side yes i think we are beginning to see semblance of some changes in terms of the consumer behavior also i uh, would you would you agree that you know once uh, uh, brands uh, kind of get established and people gain faith of them you know uh, 
over over a period of time through repetitive orders or maybe branded products that you said that e-commerce mostly 85% is offline uh, right now but maybe once we start uh, especially uh, the homemakers and elder, uh, elderly people who if they start gaining uh, you know uh, trust uh, getting uh, having trust over brand uh, more and more people are going to stick to this uh, this kind of an arrangement in the long term I think yes and no. It also depends on uh, what a brand actually truly stands for, right? Its purpose, its vision, right? So what at least we have seen in this space is a lot of uh, what I would call as fly-by-night operators, right? Uh, who have realized that uh, fruits and vegetables at some point in time seem to be the only way uh, to be in business, right? So we've seen a lot of big companies try to enter groceries and fruits and vegetables, and they've stopped actually already. I know of a large company which has actually stopped. So we are seeing a lot of activity in this space. Many of them, I truly believe, are short-term operators who are in it to sort of maximize the current situation. What will emerge at the tailwind of uh, end of COVID will be only those players who are going to be truly in it for the long run. Right uh, Today, a consumer may have a lot of choices in terms of brands or companies uh, who are claiming certain promises, value propositions. Uh, not all of those companies, I'm sure, will remain towards the tail end of COVID. At that point in time, it truly, it truly depends on you know, what the company is in it for, what is the brand standing for, what is the promise, is it consumer-friendly, farmer-friendly, is it equitable balance between the two, is it organic produce, non-organic produce, because all of these terms are being today used by everybody just to catch the consumer attention. I think only people who are in it, truly in it for the long run will survive. Uh, until then, yes, there, there will be some sort of uh, chaos in the system. Okay. Uh, we will take up the questions in a bit, but just one last question uh, uh, before we move to questions that we have got on Facebook. Uh, uh, so, Mr. Agarwal, I'll come to you. So, during all this period and given that our audience uh, consists of people from the startup community, how have the uh, funders reacted to these kind of uh, uh, pivots that uh, companies have made? Because obviously, when they made, uh, they made the uh, you know investment decision, uh, they saw one vision which was there, and then now suddenly it has to it has to move. Uh, the goalpost has to move is because of the situation. Uh, so, and obviously none of the founders would have shown a zero revenue period uh, or a COVID happening in their spreadsheets that would have presented to them. So, how have the funders reacted? Have have you got calls about what change that whether the change that you have made uh, are aligned with their vision or something like that? I think as far as the existing investors are concerned, uh, because they were seeing the same trend, same struggle across all companies. So I think they have been uh, very, very patient and uh, customers have reward rewarded them and us by coming back uh, with equal enthusiasm. I would also take this question uh, as a fact that uh, for many of the audience who who are either running a startup or who want to start something and perhaps raise funding, I would basically translate this question into the fact that whether it's a good time to raise funds, should you start something of your own or not. In terms of the funding environment, what uh, we have been seeing is that uh, when there was a period of uncertainty in the previous quarter, uh, mainly April to June, then the environment did dry up. But now, I think because the uncertainty is to some extent over and people have assumed that this is going to continue slowly uh, for some time to come. Now the deals are happening. Investors are looking at, uh, uh, at prospective deals. Uh, they are transacting. So yes, as long as you are, you are fully prepared with uh, your genuine approach towards how your business will navigate to this, to this time, or perhaps even at, take advantage of these times, I think it's a good time to basically start chatting with the uh, potential investors. Okay, Mr. Ramani. So, uh, Saurabh, uh, you know, I think uh, clearly what's become very visible right now is that, uh, you know, companies that have a uh, first principles approach, right? If you had a path to profitability or are already profitable, are able to scale up, are able to mitigate the risks that come out of such crises, I think there is a very a large pool of capital chasing such companies, right? I mean, clearly, 
Um, I think capital is, uh, you know, both VC and PE funds are flush with capital because of the US liquidity uh, that's been, you know, thrown into the whole ecosystem. So clearly funds are available, right? But the kind of companies that are getting funded have changed in uh, my opinion. I think clearly, um, you know, just on paper ideas, it's very hard to raise funds in this environment because uh, a lot of that is about the founding team and a touch and feel of understanding, meeting people. And that's become a bit of a, you know, challenge right now because of the, you know, travel and such. But large companies that are well-sorted business models, uh, you know, capital is chasing those companies, uh, specifically in, you know, areas such as where e-commerce, uh, ed tech, fintech, et cetera, where technology is at the core of it. Clearly, there's a lot uh, of capital available right now. Um, as far as your question on, you know, starting a business, I think, uh, you know, crisis is the best opportunity to start a business, right? Because what, what were seemingly challenges that, you know, you potentially were trying to solve are now in front of everybody, right? I mean, Avinash talked about how they turned into a, uh, you know, completely a B2C kind of a business. I think it's a great time to start a, a new business. Uh, good businesses will get funded. Uh, and I think there's never been a better time to uh, start new businesses than now. We have just a couple of minutes before we'll take a few questions, but uh, on the same uh, question, Mr. Arnash, I'll come to, you know, uh, obviously we, we, we hear that there's a lot of money chasing uh, businesses, but, you know, and everyone in this panel said that, you know, businesses have recovered 85%, uh, 60%, uh, but the GDP numbers or the growth numbers of the, of the economy uh, does not really reflect those numbers. So do you think still, uh, funds will chase new businesses. You had a business. You already had the farmer side. Uh, you know your uh, the procurement side was sorted, and that's why it was easier for you to go from B to B to B to C. But someone starting out right now, will that be will that be that uh, easy? I think I'll echo partially what uh, Amit uh, 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 said in the sense. I think. So obviously existing investors are supportive and accommodative of the times that we are living in and the transitions that are happening and should happen, not just for short-term survival, but also for the long-term sustainability. Uh, but uh, speaking very specific to agri-tech, I think uh, in general, after the last set of wave of uh, investments in food tech and fintech, I think generally sectorally money has started uh, uh, coming towards agri-tech. So, and thanks to COVID and thanks to the abundant set of activities that are happening regulatorily with private participants uh, in the agri-space, the spotlight is clearly on agri-tech. Uh, but as Amit said, I think, uh, yes, there's a lot of interest, a lot of startups coming up, a lot of existing players now looking at their next level of scale, trying to um, raise capital, but I think uh, the investor lens will never change in terms of viewing all of these investments with a first principle based approach, as Amit said, right? I mean, that will never change irrespective of what times it is. Uh, as I said, a lot of fly by night operators are there in the guise of wanting to raise quick capital here, trying to make use of the opportunity. I'm sure a, no, a lot of such players will not get funded by investors, even though they are out there in the market. So uh, from, from whether it is a VC or a PE, I think uh, the founding team, the opportunity that they are going behind, uh, the, the, the first principle based approach, the path to profitability are the factors that will continue to remain. The good thing that has happened during COVID is, yes, I think it is Agritech's uh, time to come into the spotlight, uh, which is great because the opportunity is huge, diverse country, multiple problem statements across the length of the supply chain. So more the spotlight on the sector, the better it is. Uh, and truly people who are actually building strong uh, businesses based on strong foundation, I think will be able to raise capital, will be able to raise, uh, 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 raise their game or scale even during these things. So we have one question for Agritech, so I'll stay with you here, Mr. Avinash. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, we have all seen Agritech uh, uh, gaining ground. And uh, uh, so at this point in time, how is a uh, cold storage business uh, would look like? Uh, Govin Tyagi wants to know, starting a cold storage. Obviously, I know that there are problems in the cold storage uh, uh, 
uh, chain in the uh, country. Obviously, some solutions have come up for these things. Yeah, I think so. We are seeing uh, quite a lot of activity, to be honest, both in terms of, uh, I would say, the fixed cold storage infrastructure as well as mobile cold storage infrastructure, which is for uh, which is for transportation of goods. I think I think uh, generally there has been a lot of activity in the past in terms of the agri infrastructure space itself in terms of investments. Uh, uh, there have been, uh, I think the government is also uh, supportive of the fact that the country requires extensive cold storage network um, uh, for a subset of the produce that can be transported and stored and uh, used over time. I think there are, the government has also subsidy mechanisms for people, people putting up fixed cold storage infrastructure. So yes, I think I think amongst us um, within the sector itself, cold storage is seeing a lot of activity. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, so we've run. Uh, we've just run out of time, but I'll take one more question. This is for you, Mr. Ramani. Uh, uh, do you do you think uh, there will be a pent up demand among freelancers and employees who would like to go to co working works workplaces? So Saurabh, uh, I being an eternal optimist uh, would like to believe so, right? So uh, I think I think the clear way that at least I look at it is that uh, because we were swimming between B2B and B2C, uh, being a hybrid co-working player, servicing enterprises as well as startups and freelancers, the startups and the freelancers and the smaller companies were the first ones to walk away because they had smaller cohort size and shorter tenures with us, right? So it's no different than the demand that comes from uh, in, in, in an airline industry from people who are just in time flyers, right? So it's the same logic, right? I mean, when pent up demand comes back and Amit Agarwal mentioned earlier that people are frustrated working, uh, sitting at home, right? They want to come back into some uh, setting which is other than a home setting, right? So clearly the entrepreneurs, the uh, freelancers, as they think about working anywhere other than uh, their home, they will come into a co-working space or a distributed network uh, environment or a flex space because what else is the option because clearly the you know the hotel lobby and uh, you know the the starbucks are not the solution right you still have people that are unknown are strange and you're going into a public environment versus a co-working where there's a lot more hygiene lot more regulation in terms of who comes in and they're all tracked so I firmly believe they will be the first ones to come back. Haven't seen that fully as yet, but I think post Diwali that uh, is going to take off. Okay. So gentlemen, we have run out of time, so we'll have to wrap up. Obviously, we have a lot of questions. We'll try to get them answered through you, uh, for, you know, post this session. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, it, it, it really is uh, uh, good to my ears to hear that, you know, the sales levels are uh, reaching, uh, you know, baseline levels of February because that gives us uh, everyone hope and uh, to our audience also who are in the startup ecosystem and wish that the recovery is reshaped for for every sector and the economy as well i will uh, thank you once again everyone to be here today i would like to see you again in the future thank you so much all right thank you Saurabh. thank you the entrepreneur team thank you yes